Welcome everybody to today's Prostate Cancer Lab meeting. Uh, today we have Willie Hoos, and we're very fortunate to have Willie here. Willie is the uh, he, uh, is the an advisor to Xcures, which many of you know because they are a, a strategic partner of ours. Uh, he is also uh, a cancer collaborator lead for the 1440 Foundation, which uh, I know has done some incredible work in pancreatic cancer. Uh, he is also the president of the Jamie Leandro Foundation for Therapeutic Cancer Vaccines. And so uh, hopefully, Willie, I've got all that right. I know that you have uh, many, many roles that you're facilitating. Um, but you're here really to speak to us about the experience you've had with personalized vaccines and developing them for cancer patients. And so we're super excited to have you here. And uh, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks. Good to see everyone. Um, so I'm going to be uh, quite transparent that I am not nearly as prepared as I like to be for one of these. So I'm gonna set low expectations, but I'm gonna leverage two things that Brad had uh, shared is you know, minimize slides, minimize the starting of the discussion and the time on that and make it about the, the, the conversation that ensues. And so we'll go where people wanna go, especially since it's a smaller group here. So um, given that, I'll share some slides. They're they're repurposed from another thing, and I'll they'll, they'll cover the topics that we want to get started. Um, but where I have missteps and such, and I I came in on a red eye uh, yesterday, and still very much uh, recovering from my last couple weeks of constant travel. So, uh, looking forward to talking with everyone. So. Uh, you see my screen? Okay. Um, yes. Really brief intro to me. So I'm, I'm running the Jamie Leandro Foundation uh, as one of the things that I do. I also work for the 1440 Foundation, uh, helping lead a uh, learning health network. Uh, and I have this programming for dummies because uh, early in my career and, and the way I talked about this, where I spent more time going into how I got here, uh, I was building a software company in the early 2000s where I hadn't been a software guy. I'd been an organic chemist and I had gotten my MBA and had an idea for a software company. And so I sat down and built the software myself and programming for dummies was, I think, literally one of the things that I used to get started. Um, and uh, But then there's a picture of the MHC peptide TCR complex there on the right that we'll talk about in a little bit, which is relevant to all of this. So, um, so what do COVID vaccines have to do with uh, cancer vaccines? And the big piece that I wanted to point out here, which is you know most of this crew probably knows, is that the part that's relevant here is you know how long most vaccines take and why does that happen? We're not going to cover all that. But if we look here, numbers one and two, sequencing of the foreign immune targets, which in this case was a virus, but in uh, the case of personalized vaccines is the cancer, which is uh, unique and different and even heterogeneous within a patient. And then the preclinical to show its potential. And then the, the, that even that was a bunch of work, and then clinical trials to show its potential and clinical trials to prove it was safe. That was where most of the energy and time went for the COVID vaccine. But when you get to a cancer that is deadly and urgent, you start to shift what, which of those things do we have to do? Where can we take risks? Where can we add uh, uh and skip, not skip, but where can we leverage what we we're pretty sure we know and take a risk reward cost benefit decision. And so the two months it took to make the vaccine components for uh, COVID is all you need to make the, to do the same exercise for a cancer to the extent that the rest of the, the thread makes sense. So that's that couple months of getting through the initial work. So, you know, the goal of a cancer vaccine is to leverage the immune system's ability to see self versus non-self and lever leverage the fact that foreign parts of the tumor that don't look like self can be uh, attacked by the tumor. 
and a comment here that we may get into in our discussions is that this mentions checkpoints here, that checkpoints are part of the story. And we may come back to some of these diagrams if we need some of the, the mechanism discussion. But like they mentioned checkpoint inhibitors, they require that the T cells that need to go kill the cell are currently there, activated, and simply being inhibited by that checkpoint. And so the vaccines are very much around, well, what if you don't have the T cells there for that? What can you do to get the T cells there? But then once they're there, you may still need the checkpoints to unleash those T cells. Um, so I'm kind of dropping. So here again, the, the way the immune system uh, works and presents this, I might, this is the simple version, but I might use this is the tumor produces a unique peptide from a mutation. That's, and again, everything I'm trying to say is kind of one of the ways to look at it and not meant to be the only perspective. So it's kind of by nature has to be somewhat simplified, but then that antigen gets processed um, and loaded onto the MHC, which is the uh, part of the immune system that presents antigens on the surface of the cell. MHC1 will focus on at the moment. And then that unique MHC peptide complex has a unique binding partner in some T cell in the body, hopefully that activates it and all the rest of the things happen. And, uh, and that's where all the magic of the way vaccines can work and the way the immune system works independent of vaccines. Um, the way we make vaccines, this is the complicated one. I put that in there in case we need to come back, but roughly you sequence the tumor. That's what all of this here is. Uh, you also sequence the patient's immune system, which can come out of whole exome sequencing. It's often good to confirm it by another method for nothing else but identity uh, confirmation. And then there's a bunch of algorithms that are developed that can process the match of the vaccine, or I'm sorry, of the of the mutations, and they're likely binding to the immune system, and they're likely potential to be immunogenic with a bunch of other characteristics. And um, all of that is what's happening through here to get to a list of potential peptides that could go into a vaccine or potential other ways to do a vaccine. <clears throat> and then those are manufactured and delivered in injections. Um, the a couple things here. This is some references from uh, trials that largely Wash U had done on the left. Um, just showing some of the potential and ability to elicit immune responses, and actually not just uh, Wash U. There's a bunch of different sources there, but there's this kind of literature evolving of some things happening with these vaccines, but it's certainly unclear that they definitely work. Here on the right is from a recent BioNTech uh, study that was done at Sun Kettering that came out in uh, at ASCO, where they had taken early stage pancreatic cancer and that scale on the bottom, you know, we can see by 18 months, almost all of the, um, all of the patients in the group that didn't show an immune response had recurred, whereas none of the patients who showed an immune response to the vaccine had recurred. Now that is not proof, this is not a randomized trial comparing those two, that was a, the ones who had an immune response did a lot better. And the vaccine is thought to be part of that, but it could be the patients who responded to the vaccine had some other thing that predicted they weren't going to recur. Um, and so there's a lot of critique of the available information out there, so I, I lay that out. Uh, there's a really good paper recently in Cell called the this uh, this vaccines a bridge uh, to a cure. There, uh, I don't know if that was my title or theirs, but they have a bridge uh, in their title, and this kind of lays out the things that are involved in the cellular players and the antigens and how you deliver it and other things you do. Those are the key thoughts of the pieces of a vaccine that are needed to get that all the way through to lasting results. And then all this stuff in the rough waters underneath are the things that can get in the way of that. Um, it's a great article. And then towards the what's next in my quick tour here, um, you know, we continue to make the vaccine available through the compassionate access. And I can talk about the compassionate access piece of this for a while, but um, there's also more advanced therapies because 
what the vaccine is trying to do is get your body to produce enough of the right T cells and then combine it with things like checkpoints or what, whatever makes sense in a given cancer and a given patient to make sure that those T cells can do their job and win the battle against the tumor. But other ways to do that are to go find out or amplify or enhance the behavior of those same that same general approach until is where they take the tumor sample and they find the T cells that are in that sample and essentially make the assumption uh, and do some verification that those T cells in the tumor are the ones that are supposed to be there doing the job. And if you just could boost those up in a variety of ways that they would finish the job. Um, ETCs, endogenous T cell therapy is one way of describing that it has other words, but that is uh, instead of taking the cells out of the tumor, taking the cells out of the peripheral blood circulating and finding the T cells that way. The harder part is now you've got billions of cells you're sorting through instead of thousands or hundreds of thousands in the tumor sample. So you have to have a better way of figuring out which ones are the right ones. So that's some of the emerging therapies that are out there. TCR therapy is skipping finding a natural cell and finding a specific T cell receptor if I go back to you know this picture, find this T cell receptor that's unique to the target that you're looking for, and then engineer that into someone else's T cells so that it goes and does the job. And that's the final thing is the New England Journal pa Med paper in pancreatic cancer showed uh, one patient with a profound response, one with a response that developed resistance or something that they don't yet understand. But a couple points that I think are fascinating is one, this was a TCR that was discovered in 2016 from a patient who did a TIL therapy at the NCI. Those TCR sequences were fully characterized there. They knew they were effective in a specific HLA-matched KRAS-specific mutation uh, patient. And then they went and found patients with that same HLA and same KRAS mutation, engineered that same TCR into those to that patient five years later. And all of that was done. They're now running a clinical trial uh, of another 24 patients I think they have the funding for. They're adding in a new drug, so they're not doing the exact same thing that was done here that had a profound uh, effect. Um, but they have like a one-year waiting list for that trial. So it's backed up because they've had so many people who see this and want to take a, sh take a shot at it. Um, but this New England Journal paper was done with two patients who were treated on compassionate access, not necessarily in a clinical trial, even in the first place. So just related to all the various pieces. So I'll pause there. Uh, and that was the quick um, view into some of the ways I'm thinking of this and happy to look forward to the discussion. That's a lot of material that hopefully is going to uh, generate a number of different questions. I can certainly kick some questions off, but I usually do that. And so I'm going to yield the floor to somebody else that may have a question. If you have a question, you want to raise your hand or you, you want to jump in right now, uh, feel free. If you're, you may be on mute. If anyone is speaking. Okay. Well, maybe I'll just go ahead and kick us off then. So, um, you know, Willie, one of the challenges with prostate cancer, as you know, is uh, it's, you know, it's a quote unquote, it's a, it's a yeah, cold cancer. Uh, so we typically don't have uh, tumor infiltration, infiltrating lymphocytes in our, uh, in our cancer cells. I, I, I know for sure that I don't. Um, with personalized vaccines, you know, how successful are they in, uh, you know, in cold cancers? Yeah. And I mean, I think this is where, you know, there's definitely other people with perspectives on this on the call, I think. So, uh, please anyone jump in. I think to me, the definition so, so it comes down to the reason I went back to this slide is what does cold tumor mean mm -hmm. and why is it such? And is that uh, changeable? Because 
pancreatic cancers have always been characterized as cold. And, you know, the first version of that was, well, they don't have as many mutations as melanoma, which has this massive amount of DNA damage from UV rays. And so therefore, like they, the, the answer is they just don't have the right targets. And, and so therefore it's cold because there was nothing to target. But then you have an example where you put the right TCR KRAS targeted cell in there and they can do their job. And then what, what else? And then as we've understood more, right, it's not just that they don't necessarily have the, enough of the mutations, but they also have this stroma and other things in the microenvironment that they recruit various cells or just excrete compounds and such that make the immune system not see it or not enter that area. And you have this tumor microenvironment that is immunosuppressive. So even if a T cell went in there and recognized it, it's going to get shut down. And some of that suppression was checkpoint inhibitors. So that was the early, you know, those were the understandings that in melanoma and, you know, I believe I, I like, so what's the status with prostate and in checkpoints, but I believe the first CTLA breakthrough study that came with the first CTLA drug that ended up getting approved, one of the first studies that everybody was getting excited about as from the version of history that I understand was in a prostate study at the Mayo, where they saw evidence of some patients getting benefit. So uh, you know, then it shifted to melanoma where there was a much bigger response and a much better in the new understanding of what was driving, what was dependent on what, that that was lower hanging. Um, but there has been various levels of success in what percent of patients can get the benefit in prostate as an example. So uh, it's a start of an answer is, and so I think to me, the punchline of that is, cold for what reason? And then what do you do to warm it up? Yeah. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, in prostate cancer, we hear a lot about bispecific uh, T-cell engagers, bites, uh, CAR-T, chimeric antigen receptor t uh, t uh, therapy. Um, maybe talk about those. There's also another one called Provenge, um, you know, so there are a few different approaches uh, to engaging T cells. Maybe if you could um, help us understand the difference between bites, CAR T, and personalized uh, vaccines. Um, yeah, and, and you know, so this is I start to hit my limits on the full landscape of of the environment of all the things being tried and. Mm -hmm. um, but Brad maybe has a, a thing he was going to throw in and I can, I, I have a slide, I think that I can kind of use to talk to some of that, but Brad, please go ahead and anyone else. I was going to ask a question, so I don't have a comment here. Okay. Um, give me, just give me a second. I'm trying to see if I have any of the slides that talk about some of the cofactors and such. That's, um, that's fine. So maybe while you're searching for that, uh, I'll kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, fill in some some uh, dead air here a little bit. Um, you know, there, there seems to be, a, you know, more of a push of, of going for whole exome sequencing. I was just at an Illumina uh, Genomics Forum a couple of weeks ago, They're talking about the cost of whole genome sequencing going down significantly. Uh, I've recently had conversations with Wild Cornell about some work that they're doing to integrate whole genome sequencing with RNA-seq uh, analysis. Um, and this is going to lead to another question, but, you know, as, as the cost of sequencing is essentially going down, access to whole exome sequencing, which is what these personalized vaccines are based on, uh, may, might should be more available to people. If we move to whole genome sequencing, is it possible that that will unlock better vaccines for patients? Um, yeah, I think it's it's a good question. So there's a company in 
the UK or in the Netherlands, I believe is where they are. And let's just have a call with, with one of them soon where they're using whole genome as the input. Um, I can pull up this slide, which actually kind of covers the, the last topic and this one just a, a little bit at least is, um, you know, so here's all the possible sources of a neoantigen. Um, <clears throat> and even outside of quote neoantigens, there's also, you know, some of the older vaccines and approaches have been saying, well, we have to have a common antigen. It's not worth, you can never personalize things enough at scale to, uh, to do individualized. So we have to find personalized ones. You know, there's always a little bit of like looking for the keys under the light post with looking for the personal or, or the non-personal kind of common, also called public antigens. If it, you know, what if that won't work, right? Like what if you need to have three, four, five, six successful targets uh, to that are personal to that cancer to really get enough of an effect. And I think there's arguments on both sides of that. But the the red, um, I believe the blue on this diagram, and you know, this was a diagram I which I don't know if I have the reference for this one, but it's not my diagram. Um, but here's a bunch of places. This is from that Bridges uh, article, I believe, that in Cell is you know, single new up in the left, the single new nucleotide variations and the indels, those come out of regular normal sequencing. Um, if there's other things that are splice variants and such, you can see that in RNA sequencing, for example, um, but fusion genes can be more difficult to detect if they're coming from, you know, causing something that's not, you know, captured properly in whole genome sequencing or whole, our whole exome sequencing, for example. Um, and then some of the other, you know, changes into places that aren't necessarily uh, covered in an exome. On the flip side of the exome genome question, the genome, this is back to cost and quality and such, the, when we've had patients come to us for whole genome, the issue is that sometimes their whole genome depth is less because that, and so some of your confidence in calling of mutations or of a clonal, subclonal mutation is less clear. And the, if it's not a target, if it's not expressed, right? So part of our design process is not just get the whole exome, but then use the whole transcriptome uh, to confirm that a mutation is actually expressed and there's no perfect answer to quantifying that that amount of expression leads to sufficient amount of peptide to expect an immune response to that's probably some of the failure modes for the algorithms but all of that is so what's the extra things that come out of the whole genome that you can't get out of the whole exome that are driven all the way to expression and it's a little less clear uh, exactly what extra things you get and how often that happens. I'd love, I, I'm sure if the uh, my Neo folks were on, they would have answers on that. And they've, they've shared some of those answers with me and I kind of get it, but don't fully. Um, so that's, that's kind of the answer there is, and you know, why are we doing panels instead of whole exome? It was a cost issue. It was a stage of technology that arguably is past. So now with things like that TCR sequencing, if you have a KRAS HLA match, like you should be seeking that out. It's a waiting list and all of that, but like it's profound and it's a reasonable risk reward profile and everything else. And I you know, it has to be proven more, but I believe it's a priority. So the challenge there is, um, you know, the world's still doing panels for most patients when you could get HLA typing for free in a whole exome. So you start stacking up all the benefits of it creates the optionality to do a vaccine. It maybe picks up some mutations that weren't on the panel that turn out to be relevant, even though that's rarer. And you get the expression information perhaps in a slightly different way than you get on a panel and you get HLA typing to possibly go prioritize, you know, some other TCR type therapies that are out there. It starts to be, why aren't we doing that? And I don't have the equivalent answer for the whole genome, but I'm, I assume there are some. Okay. 
Super helpful. All right. Some questions that are starting to come in. So, I mean, I can, I can riff on this topic a little bit more. Maybe we'll come back to it. Yeah. Um, so one, so, just one last. So I, I just, this article, this here is mm -hmm. just showing an example of the binding of the MHC1 to the, to the peptide and uh, it's not maybe the best one, but the point is that there's a CDA cofactor and there's a bunch of other things that are required. And those bites and those bispecifics are trying to say, uh, this is actually probably a bad diagram for it, but the, the point is that there's a bunch of different other checkpoints and multiple bindings needed. And most of those bites and such are trying to overcome that in some way to say, let's have a cell or a therapy that doesn't rely on a whole orchestra spontaneously coming together. Let's put the critical factor in, but let's add a couple other factors that increase the chance that it all works. And the only, you know, the, the downside of that is that the, this is so complex. What are the unintended consequences of bypassing some of the, the, the less natural ways of doing things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another topic too, just in terms of like yeah. risks of going after a personalized vaccine. We, we can uh, put that in the parking lot. Um, so Brad, I, I know you're driving, uh, but you've had your hand up for a while. So um, question from you. Yeah, I, I want to get into the mechanics and you started talking about it. Um, how should a patient uh, think about this? Is it preclinical? Is it clinical? Is it ready for prime time? Is it phase one? Is it phase two? And assuming that it's uh, something that someone would want to put. Most of our patients have a treatment options list and they're prioritizing it. Should it be on the short list? And if so, where should it be on the short list? And what does it mean to access? So I just want to translate from, the, you know, kind of the, I don't know, the chemistry or the science of it to the logistics of and operations and implementation of this for a patient. Sure. Um, so I, uh, I don't, I don't have a slide on JLF's process, um, but briefly, you know, JLF is, you know, I'll just put this up is our website for those who haven't looked at it and such. So JLF, we're running a compassionate access program. We also have a research IND and a research study open. Uh, but it's a patient pay program. It's $80,000. It takes about three months to make the vaccine and it uses whole exome sequencing as the input. So RNA, DNA, DNA for tumor and normal, RNA for um, uh, the transcriptome. Uh, we've been using Boston Gene and Tempest. Both of those can work. Boston Gene specifications are more in line with what we need. Um, there are other sequencing providers, but as to date, we have not been able to get the raw data that we need from them or their test specifications are not sufficient. Um, the, we run a compassionate access, which is also called expanded access, uh, single patient IND in most cases. The requirements of that are roughly that the patient has a serious disease where the benefits outweigh the risks of the vaccine. Uh, and um, so that's kind of an individual and patient physician decision on what that is. And then the FDA re reviews that. Um, but, you know, most serious metastatic cancers without high potential, you know, long duration of, of stability, of stable disease or better, any, any tumor type and stage that doesn't have that situation is likely eligible for the vaccine, you know, with, with certainly with exceptions. And um, that's that side of it. We haven't, for because I know there's a lot of prostate, uh, you know, theme in the group here. We, I don't, I, I think there definitely have been and are, I believe also ongoing vaccine related trials in prostate and pro and I think you mentioned um what, what the the prostavac is that the the one that is approved so there's yeah, that's, there's, uh, yeah provenge yes provenge yeah so mm -hmm. there are you know I think there's precedents that there's some potential benefit 
out there for the strategy in prostate, but this is where I hit my limits on, we haven't had a patient with prostate go through this. And I don't know where the data would actually suggest that this is a waste of time and it's not, you know, it, the, the risks are relatively low. Um, you know, the, the, the peptide vaccines from everything that's been seen appear to be relatively safe. All of this is in the consent form and everything, but, you know, most of the side effects are, are limited to kind of, you know, the similar to getting a flu vaccine or something where it's, you know, you get a sore arm or you get a fever for a day or two. And that's, um, that's the main pieces of the vaccine alone. If you were to add checkpoint inhibitors, right, those have their risks. Are those risks enhanced by the vaccine? Uh, you know, we don't know that for sure, but, um, it, you know, it seems like the science s supports that that wouldn't necessarily. So um, <clears throat> hopefully that partially answers your question, Brad, as far as what's the, the process. And then I, I started to go into prostate and I don't have a great answer for where this should go on everybody's list, but there's, you know, what we know is it has to be, uh, it can't get in the way of trying something that should be higher priority. That's one of the things the FDA is worried about and, and is, is in the backdrop of how they evaluate things that from what we've seen clearly. And then, you know, it has the financial implications and the risks of an unapproved drug are also so part of it. So speak about it then in another cancer like pancreatic, what are the patients that are showing up who are selecting, working with you? What is their profile? Yeah, so uh, it's been mostly metastatic patients who are somewhere in there uh, on various chemos or have been on trials and are trying to plan ahead knowing that this takes three months. Um, you know, to including this in one of their next therapies or adding it to their existing chemo regimen, or if they have to take a chemo break, having the vaccine ready to boost their chance of something uh, happening uh, better than kind of the known path. Um, but that said, like one of the critiques of vaccines and is that the tumors start to get more heterogeneous as they get larger and more diffused. And, you know, and spread out in multiple sites in the body, and that they develop more of that microenvironment, for example. And so that's suppressive to the immune system. So probably the less cancer you have, the earlier stage, the better. So where, do, where does this fit for earlier stage disease? It's not exactly clear. A lot of the trials have been done in the earlier stages of cancer, right after surgery, for example, was that chart I showed. And so I think from a clinical trial design of an experiment to answer a scientific question, that's where there has been a, a, a focus. Can it work in the later stage? When that's when a lot of patients start to turn their attention to something like this. I think you know we have um, you know there's a case study out there from uh, you know a patient who had radiation and dual checkpoint after they'd been on vaccine for a couple of months and got you know, a pretty profound response that's ongoing and durable a couple of years later with metastatic pancreatic cancer. So there's examples where the whole of the efforts may, uh, may point to some responses even in later stages of disease, but it's not clear. I know I kind of, I don't have a crisp answer to that one. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, tag on to that a little bit. So um, what about patients who have seen immunotherapies like uh, Pembro or Keytruda, um, do you see them come through and any insights in terms of, um, you know, how their response is improved on a new antigen vaccine versus, you know, uh, a, an in both, uh, you know, off the shelf immunotherapy? Yeah, I, I um, you know, our experience is new and limited enough, you know, we're, we're mirroring the trial designs that have been done at wash you in breast and in pancreatic and and making that available to patients that it makes sense for but we don't have you know the results of trials to say in the patients who are in their post checkpoint versus pre checkpoint this is how it works relatively i mean we don't know those things at all um so i think then you go to the science and 
there is some scientific preclinical work, and I think linked with some some analysis of some trials that there's a there's there's risk in data that the PDL1 can kind of exhaust the T cell repertoire that's there, and then perhaps undermine the emergence of new uh, cell therapy, you know, T cell responses. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the common from most of the people doing trials and who understand that science and their, their current opinion is you're better off having the checkpoints after the vaccine has had a chance to, to start to do its job. So, you know, we do five injections the first three weeks is kind of the priming phase. And there's some science for why that is. And, uh, and, and there's some just history and then it shifts to monthly. So getting through that priming primary series where there's a, 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 at least a emerging set of T cells that have been activated before expecting to unleash the checkpoint mechanisms is the current thought process, at least for the PDL one CTLA four is a little different because it may be involved in helping the T cell response get started so that mm -hmm. those two may not actually belong together if you're mm -hmm. really optimally doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's a, that's kind of an answer there. I think the flip side is, you know, the vaccines aren't proven, so we don't know for sure. And if you have a potential to respond to checkpoint inhibitors, but that might on their on on its own and you don't have time to give one or two or three more months for the, to get through the vaccine manufacturer administration and waiting period you you, you want to try and get the benefit of the checkpoints because they have potential on their own then you know you have to you have to take the primary treatment goal first and then the potential that 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 undermines some of the vaccine's potential is just part of the risk yeah bottom. yeah no it's it's a it's a real issue you know i've been on a checkpoint inhibitor as i mentioned um there are other um, patients on here who also may have had them i can't remember for sure you know i'm thinking about provenge you know um so i i don't know emma i see that you're on do you have any thoughts in terms of sequencing these various treatments for prostate cancer patients? Um, I think it's very much depend depends on the particular um, mutational setup in each tumor because the immune, I mean, prostate cancer is not considered to be uh, immune heart cancer in particularly, but combination, for example, with the PARP inhibitors in cancers that have mutations in homologous recombination pathway sometimes work. Um, I, I didn't see much success in combining the newer generation androgen signaling inhibitors with uh, immune drugs. So um, the, the, I mean, Willie, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just um, I wanted to ask if you had any successes with any cancers so far. Jane, yeah. I mean, because the in the literature the reports are kind of not very impressive so far. The works as you mentioned melanoma of course and lung cancer there were reports quite a few years ago of uh, good responses. Uh, Rosenberg's lab uh, reported some, but they don't I mean the approach is kind of a little less sort of uh, directed towards personalized vaccines. It's a mixture of everything, TILs, peripheral T, uh, T cells. Um, now they do sequencing, of course, in a couple of trials at least. So um, I mean, I, I think the data, you know, is is definitely lacking on the ultimate. Does this give clinical efficacy? I think there's yeah. there's case reports where there was response duration for the combination of things people were doing that were, you know, more than accepted. But that is not medical evidence, right? So that piece yeah. for sure. I think you know things like this. Um, 
let, let me, I'm just pulling up a couple slides. Um, I'm going to share again. Um, Uh, where was the, so, you know, back to this, I mean, this is some of the yeah. literature with some of the pointing to things, but, you know, this is that pancreatic data. And there's one interpretation of this, that the patient's getting an immune response for, you know, a, 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 a significant immune response to the targets in the vaccine. We're not having recurrence, but there's another way to interpret this, that it was a, it was essentially a, pro a prognostic value that patients who are capable of raising an immune response are just the ones that were, were keeping the tumors in check and weren't going to recur. Is the vaccine part of it? The other, the other thing that I was going to you know, bring up is that pr it's prior to JLF, but the patient that I kind of alluded to and, and her story and the case report are out there, but this was a pancreatic patient um, who, uh, you know, had had multiple lines of therapy. And then where this line is, they, they actually started their vaccine around here. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was a little blip of some immune response via L-spot. So that's L-spot is looking for T cells that are responsive to components of the vaccine, not necessarily proving that those T cells are capable of getting into the tumor and killing the tumor. But then she, because of progression, added radiation and dual checkpoints, so nevo ipi, all because there was data saying that radiation and dual checkpoint look to have some immune response and some response rate higher than any of those three things together in metastatic disease. And all three of those things theoretically help a vaccine response, help traffic tumor T cells into the tumor and help with the activation by those two checkpoints and the expansion. And so the Ellis spot level shot way up, CA199 normalized mm -hmm. um, in the three months following all of that. And so that combination. So I think, and then we've continued to look deeper and find some, uh, look into that Ellis spot response and find specific T cell receptors that appear to be active and it's still kind of ongoing work. So I, I bring that up as like, there's a trial being designed right now to basically repeat this protocol uh, in right. a formal trial to evaluate, is it a one out of five, one out of 10, one out of a hundred scenario, or was it truly an anomaly and completely unrelated? Uh, and, and that's, I think, hopefully we'll get those trials done as well, but at, in the interim, it's a set of things that you know we, the 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 couple that that went through this they 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 spoke in an event I was at this weekend and that the one point they made is that no inventions were required for them to do this they were accessing things that had all been done before they were assembled logically together to yield something that's not scientifically clear exactly what happened but the result is what was hoped for so, you know, that's, that's this balance of where this compassionate access and where the state of the field is, is that if it turns out in 10 years, we figured out the exact story here, you know, what regrets or what opportunities will now, you know, do, do they have the opportunity to, to seek? That was helpful. I was looking at her journey and I was, of course, paying close mm -hmm. attention to the diagnostics. And I noticed a couple of things. One is, looks like they were using uh, organoids. Um, so I'm so they they were testing the vaccine on an organoid. Did they go through multiple iterations of the vaccine based upon the organoid response? Do you have any insight on that? Um, so it is ongoing work <laughs> to try and understand the organoid vaccine linkage, but not the organoids were done to, for, to do chemosensitivity testing. And, um, this patient also had a HER2 amplification, which is kind of uncommon in pancreatic cancer and could have had something to do with all those, although that nothing in that was a target of the vaccine because that was a, it wasn't a mutant HER2, it was just amplified. 
So it was, it was a, you couldn't target something like that necessarily. So um, the, the, whether the T cells that appear to be the ones that were active to the vaccine and would be hypothesized to be the ones that hopefully wiped out the tumors, uh, have that experiment to test that against the organoids has not yet been done, but is trying to be done. Okay, that was helpful. Uh, my internet just kind of like um, went haywire for like the last 15 seconds, but um, I think I got most of it. So um, there's also another diagnostic, and maybe Shino can, uh, from MProbe can comment on this a little bit, but um, there were proteomics involved. And can you talk a little bit about how proteomics helped to improve, if it did, the development of the vaccine? Yeah, and, and Shino can, so again, the proteomics were done primarily in the search for additional therapy priorities that were outside the vaccine. Um, and uh, the, their, the confirmation of expression for the uncommon mutations in theory could be done via a proteomics but it would be a lot of method development. And uh, I'm not even sure that the, essentially the level of detection sensitivity that could be developed in rapid time would be, you would know whether that level of detection was useful for prioritizing or deprioritizing a given target. Uh, so I think the so the prote so the short answer is the proteomics were not part of the vaccine part of that therapeutic journey. Um, they were part of the her two part of the story as well as the backup planning part of the story. Okay, helpful. Shino, anything to add to that? No, I agree. I agree with really, uh, especially with the fact that. Uh, when you're looking for any peptide that is going to get presented into the, um, you know, the MHC complex, the amount of material that you need sometimes uh, is way more than you know, typical proteomics would do. And we have to go through some little bit more method development to actually figure out whether that peptide got expressed or not. I mean, outside of, outside of uh, using a DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing, um, and we could find out what that peptide was. Uh, but at this junction, based on what we have with the sequencing and the informatics, you're basically taking in a calculated risk. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and since this is recorded and um, you know, someone may refer back to it, I'll make a point here that, <clears throat> so this, this TD is, Actually, I oops, sorry. Um, this TD is actually the the and her two uh, antibody drug conjugate her two drug that she got after the vaccine and the checkpoints. But what's relevant in that <clears throat> is that by the time she went on that, the the CN nineteen nine was almost normalized. So like drawing down this line, I think it was right at this point where it was at a log two, which is CN nineteen nine of like a hundred down from. I think this peak was about 7,000 here. So the, the three months following vaccine and radiation uh, 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 and dual checkpoint, the CN99 had almost normalized. And then there was a lot of debate in this case of there had subsequently been HER2 expression confirmed to still be there in the sample that was taken at the time of the radiation. So the sequencing had come back then because it was repeated. HER2 was still there and it was looked at in the face of, well, they're getting what looks like a profound immune response. Well, where are the places where immune responses can fail? We can be fooling ourselves and it's not really happening. And there's some tumor about to grow back or there's an escape where they lose their MHC expression and therefore the immune system can't target it anymore because it can't present the antigens and be targeted. Um, so the, the thought was use the HER2 drug in case there's some minimal residual or resistant disease to go in and do that. But it was done 
So that could be part of why this is an ongoing no evidence dis of disease two and a half years later is that there was some resistance there that was knocked out by the targeted approach or the immune system took care of it and is surveilling it and the HER2 wasn't part of it at all. But it was all clearly <laughs> happening prior that to the vaccine and the, uh, prior to the addition of that HER2 drug because of how much the CA19 and I had dropped and how many the other signals of things turning around. Um, the last part of that slightly complicated story, which I, but I think it speaks to a lot of what this group is trying to do, a plan out a series of things uh, that can be done. How can you inform it by diagnostics is we actually back here did, and all this predated JLF, but was some of the inspiration for why we're doing JLF. <laughs> but um, we back in here, when she was clearly progressing on the prior HER2 targeted therapy, there was a question of there are now better HER2 drugs. Do you keep going after that? Or do you switch strategies altogether if they're not compatible, right? If you can't do them in parallel. And the, the decision was that the vaccine could at least be done in parallel, but the checkpoints perhaps started to add risk of, at that time, there wasn't even knowledge about checkpoints and in HER2, for example. So they wanted to maximize the vaccine and add checkpoints, but they wanted to maximize the HER2 strategy. Could you do all that together? And so as part of the planning, she didn't have easy access to a biopsy at that time, or it was didn't seem worth the risk. Um, and so of just the complications from a biopsy, and it was going to take time. And so we did a blood-based circulating DNA, and that came back and showed negative for HER2 amplification. And, and so that said, well, maybe there's evidence that tumors can lose the HER2, especially having what looked like it was a response on a prior HER2 therapy. And so that actually caused the change in strategy to prioritize radiation and checkpoints along with the vaccine rather than also continuing to go after her too. And so it was while that was happening and the response was then happening, the sequencing came back and showed that the her two was still there. So that disconnect from those two methodologies, I think it may have been a fortuitous, perhaps lucky, you know, that the circulating DNA wasn't good enough for detecting the her two amplification in her case, but it led us on a different path that probably turned out to be the best path. Wow, that's a fascinating story. Um, and you know, as prostate cancer patients, um, you know, with liquid biopsies, for example, uh, for for me, for example, you know, I have a very low PSA, and in some instances, when I have a liquid biopsy, it will show no mutations, no biomarkers to go after. Yeah, you know, I have to wait till my PSA is at a high enough level where it's going to. Uh, shed enough, um, you know, uh, cell-free DNA. Um, so uh, that's a fascinating story, though. Uh, Eric Hall, uh, he's a new patient with us. Eric, you have a few questions in the chat. I think that Willie was able to answer some of them, but I want to come back to you to make sure that uh, all of your questions were were answered. Do you have any more? Um. <laughs> Yeah. So, so one, Willie, thanks for, for coming and, and giving this. It's, I think it's a, like a, a glimpse maybe of, of the future of, of where treatment and medicine is going, right? Um, I, I guess what I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as me as like a new patient, obviously you mentioned something about that it could be more successful earlier in someone's journey than, than later before there's more, more uh, heter, heterogeneity. Um, and, and so I guess I'm wondering do have you ever I guess it's all research now I guess I'm wondering is it is there any kind of access for someone to like, like myself to towards that right uh, right now early in the journey um yeah and are are you comfortable just just like a 30 second like how early just just to make sure I know because I think yeah so I am I'm three months into my journey um process PSA was 146 with Gleason 10. I'm on my first line of treatment being hormones, ADT of Orbergovix and Zytiga. Yeah. So, uh, so here, static with a, with a lymph node and stuff. Yeah. So here, here's, again, I don't have the, the answers here, but the, this is where what's optimal, what's regulatory allowed, what's appropriate, you know, what's financially the right 
time value of money of doing things earlier versus later and such. Um, I don't know how to make this decision. <laughs> um, the I can go to the regulatory is there specific language of what qualifies. And then I can share some of the feedback and pushback that we've had. There's been a few patients that are a little earlier stage and the FDA has pushed, well, we want assurances that the patient is not foregoing therapies that are proven for something that's unproven and that they may not understand what they're getting into. And there's a lot of nuance in multiple parts of that sentence or phrase, and it gets to all kinds of libertarian perspectives and everything else that you could get to. But I think I, I, I absolutely agree <clears throat> that a early stage breast cancer patient, so I'm going to ex explicitly extract it to something that has 95% plus quality survival with not major long-term side effects um, of in a disease where 30 years ago, those results were nowhere near that. And so the therapies of radiation and chemo and such and surgery that are the accepted standards in that early stage disease result in very, very good outcomes. If a patient were saying, I don't like those things and I think these vaccines are really cool, I want to do that instead, that's instead part is is really a much harder like <laughs> thing to really support right because they're arguably making a decision that significantly <laughs> increases their risk even if these turn out to work better than we expect now as you go later into it and you start to reveal that that patient is not likely in the 95 percent without additional interventions somewhere in there it switches but even at that early stage if it's possible for them to add the vaccine in the sequence somewhere then it becomes much more a, what's the risk of doing that and like there may not be that many risks and then what's the cost and is it appropriate and ethical and appropriate for that person to take on those costs so that's the, you know, and then before somebody asked the question of should society take on that cost, like, you know, I think if it's eighty thousand dollars is is cheap for a cancer drug, if this were an improved drug for being sold, right? Like it likely ends up being more if these ever get approved. But at the same time, maybe we could find a way to make these for ten thousand dollars. But even there, you know, what's the threshold for society paying ten thousand dollars? per woman diagnosed with breast cancer for everyone right up front as part of that. That's a that's a much broader topic than can a patient pay $80,000 today for <laughs> their own decision. I totally agree with what Willie just said, especially regarding your case, Eric, which I'm working on now. I'm from Cancer Commons. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Uh, Eric, you're in good hands. Emma is absolutely amazing. So um, thanks, Emma. I, I can't thank you enough. We're at the top of the hour. I'm going to stop the recording right now.